The following is a fan off production. Under 17, not admitted without parents. Five, four, three. Welcome to the main event. You're playing with the best. The arena can't hear you. Say it with your chest. After all, this show's monumental. World heavyweight champs pass intercontinental. Did he do it? Yeah, he did it. Go figure. Competition, competition. Saturday night special, so it's best you ignore that. Hate and eliminate them if they in the fatal four way. Best there is, best there was, the best there ever will be. RBR. And folks, it is. And I. I am so happy to be here. Sorry for the late start, folks. Uh, it turns out that for whatever reason, my computer just decided. I feel like Windows updates are like legit <laughs> the the worst uh, when it comes to timing. Um, and literally, I sat down and my computer's being all funky, and I'm like, "All right, let me restart it." And then it kicks in and it goes, "Okay, Windows updates will initiate." I'm like, "No, that's not what I wanted. I just wanted to restart." And, uh, and then it counts down percentage wise, and then the computer restarts, and then it restarted like three or four times to the point of where I'm like, "Oh no, am I like stuck in a boot loop? Like, if I screwed here?" And then it actually kicked in. Uh, but we are here. It is wrestling with weekends it's my favorite part of the weekend and folks i am joined by one of my favorite guys in the wrestling community ladies and gentlemen it's mr joe holbert wow what an indictment on the wrestling community that is huh i I appreciate (laughs) that i I mean i can relate to that windows windows update deal man that's like the the ultimate podcaster enemy right right no i'm happy to be here man it's great well especially when you're like going live because like uh when you have something to do of course it decides like right now this is the time that you need to update and granted there's probably plenty of times i could have done it myself because you know you get the little Mm pop-up and it's like uh hey windows would like to update right now and i'm like eh whatever let's do this later and then i like kick the can down the road and then finally at a time where i actually need to use my computer for something then it's like nah this can't wait windows updates have to go live right now man this is about to be one of the most exciting weeks like ever uh i am just I can't believe this is about to happen. Uh, wait, before we get into all of that, a uh, couple of things. I do want to let everybody know that with this being live, and hey, Taxel in the chat says, Joe! Uh, so, uh, Fair. The, uh, this is a show that we do live on Saturdays. And hey, uh, good morning, Thaliano. Daliono. I had it right last year, or last year, last week, uh, the last two weeks. Um, but I do want to let everybody know that there's a couple of ways to check this show out. Uh, you can uh, listen via audio at Mixler. That's Mixler.com slash fanoff. Uh, again, Mixler.com slash fanoff. Uh, there's a chat there if you're just audio wise. And I see Carrie in the chat and Ann talks. And Mike Harmeyer. Mike, I hope you're going to be. At Arthur Ashe this weekend, I, I have a feeling you will be because uh, uh, I know you were at um, you were at the Pru in Jersey this week, and I feel like there's if there's any show to miss, uh, that would have been the one. So uh, hope to see you at Arthur Ashe. Uh, and I see Knock Knock in the chat. Yep, he says he'll be there. Uh, so yeah, definitely. Uh, and, of course, that's what I'm talking about when I say this is going to be an exciting week. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention is uh, giving us a call, 909-581-4RBR. That's 909-581-4727. If you want to be in on this show and just uh, get your thoughts in, uh, if you have any thoughts on the things we're talking about this week or you just have any uh, feelings of excitement Uh, Are you in New York? Are you going to be in New York? I'm going to be in New York. Uh, And you know the thing I love about these wrestling trips that I've taken lately? Um, Most of them have been... uh, Oh, and there's... uh, There is... Jarrett Bailey says, Have a great show. Or good show, gents. Uh, Got NFL coverage I gotta do. We'll listen later on. P.S. Cheers, Joe. Um, And... Yeah... Uh, I, I just feel like, like all out, for example, all out was one of those shows I took a chance on, uh, just because 
it was just exciting. You know, that nothing had been announced when all out tickets went on sale. Uh, but I just knew that was the show that I wanted to be at and had to be at. Uh, there was no CM Punk rumors at the time. The, that story hadn't even broken yet. Uh, there was no hints at Brian Danielson yet. That story hadn't broke yet when those tickets went on sale. There was none of that out there. So it was one of those like, took a chance on that show and it ended up paying off. And same with the only thing about um, Grand Slam coming up this week that I knew going in was that Arthur Ashe looked hella dope and I would like to be in that audience when it happens. So this is interesting because we can, you know, get into Dynamite as a broader subject. But so before this past Dynamite and Rampage, I had began to kind of waver in terms of like, is this our fresh show going to be as stacked as we initially thought it was? You know, when they first <laughs> announced like, um, you know, MJF and Pillman and it's like, okay, you know, I just thought, will it be a, a good TV of a great main event? Or will it be the special show that we've all been fantasy booking for months? And then as we know, obviously, you know, we can get into more detail. At the end of Dynamite, you know, it basically, I've never experienced anything like the TV run that they provided this week. Like, it was it was an out-of-body experience. Like, that too? And it was as the show went along, you realize what was coming together. So, like, for, you know, FTR jumping Sting, he was like, oh, my God, they're going to do that match. They're insane. <laughs> yes. God, it rolled so much, man. <laughs> I know, right? Because, like, even still, I, I, I kind of somewhat had a little bit of the same feeling. I think what put me in a good place about it all was, um, honestly, when uh, the story broke that Brian was going to be at All Out. Because yeah. the original rumor was that he's going to debut at Arthur Ashe. And, my, and, you know, there was a lot of speculation about how, oh, are they just afraid that Arthur Ashe isn't going to happen? Is that what's going on? And I thought... No, I don't think that's the case. Like, keeping in mind, Brian Danielson, all-time favorite wrestler. And knowing what I know about Brian, I thought, and sure enough, he's confirmed it's true, but Brian is a pro wrestler, and the thing he loves more than anything else is wrestling. And if he knows he's going to be in front of AEW's largest audience possible, he's not going to come to do that to do a promo. He wants to have the best match possible. And so when that rumor hit, my immediate thought was, O'Brien's wrestling at uh, at Arthur Ashe. The question is just who, and if he's going to be wrestling at Arthur Ashe, it has to be the biggest match possible. And initially, you know, on this very show, I convinced myself, you know, uh, probably like somebody like Nick Jackson was what I said. I was like, you know, if he's going to start with the elite, he could probably start on the lower rung, but still do something cool. Um, but the fact that they were just like, nope, Kenny. It's just, it's just Kenny Omega. And I even respect that they uh, they went around the rankings mm-hmm. and were just like, nope, it's non-title, but it's still Kenny. We're doing it. And I was... It's a special one, right? When you, Even when you're listening to you, Lanny, it's, like, it's, it's a crazy time. I had resigned myself. And when I say resigned, so I don't even mean a negative way, but I had assumed they were going to do the eight-man tag. So it was going to be Brian with, with um, you know, Christian, Dress Express versus the, the Elite. And it's like, that sounds that, great. It still sounds great. <laughs> yeah. But then when, when Adam Cole said, we want to do, we're going to do a six-man next week on Rampage, my mind was like, oh, my God, they're going to do Brian and Kenny. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I love the way they did it, as you said, you know, the non-title, just the idea that you kind of feed into what the audience sees it as, which is the ultimate exhibition to the great professional. Like, that's the way they're kind of – even though there's a conflict here, that's kind of the idea, right? Like, forget the title. This is about two of the great pro wrestlers ever, frankly, just in the same ring at our fresh mm-hmm. stadium. And, like, I think AEW is such a um, – it so often is like a reminder of just how simple this stuff can be, man. Especially because if you're, if you're building the same we want to see, man, we'll, we'll happily go along for the ride on this stuff, you know? Yeah. And that's what this show, the story of this show, I mean, there's so much <laughs> stuff to – so much meat on the bone with the off rash, but that is obviously the match. That's, that's an all-timer. Yeah, I am. Honestly, if they announced nothing else. And then the fact that, like, last night they announced the, um, uh, what was it? Uh, the, the Lights Out? The Lights Out match, yeah. Well, when they announced the Lights Out match, uh, I, mind blown, right? Because at that <laughs> point, I thought, I was satisfied with everything they had going into uh, 
going into Arthur Ashe, going into the um, Grand Slam. And but I knew that there had to be at least three more matches because they announced a two hour rampage and they'd only right. announced three matches and their average two hour show has uh, six matches. And so I was like, there still has to be three matches. But at this point, with what you've got, I'm good. And then they yeah. threw those other three on there and the lights out match. Well, are you kidding me? Like, I am. Um, I'm just so excited. I'm I, it's such a. um it's so dumb to me that this like blew my mind, but I'll be honest, it did. The idea of just treating it as it's a four hour pay per view we're gonna split in half for television mm-hmm. is like the best use of a great setting. Yes. I can recall in and <laughs> but when I say it, it sounds very simple, right? But like it kind of feels like a novel deal we've got here. This was like a one off in in recent rest of memory at least. It's a TV this be honest, I don't think I'm getting ahead of myself and saying that like when people reflect on this time in wrestling, and it's a fun time, they're probably going to have the Arthur Ashe visual in their head. This show would have to have a lot of issues for it not to be remembered forever. Let's be real. They've got so many can't-miss matches. But one thing that interests me, I'm interested where you're at on this, Will, is someone said, and it may have been on the chat um, in our show, it was like opening with Brian and Omega. And I, and I initially my reaction was, but then what follows it? And it's like, you could main event with Sting, you could main event with Britt. How would you feel if you know Dynamite plays? I, music that's what I want, honestly. Yes. I feel like, like if I can get in fantasy Booker mode, uh, to me, I want to see, I want to see it open. And the reason I want to see it open is because I know the format of Dynamite, and yeah. Dynamite's format usually is that they don't take their first commercial break until about the twenty-five minute mark. So uh, that tells me that oh, the first match never has a commercial break. Um, and so thinking about what match on that card would I want to see not interrupted? And that's the one. That's the one I want to see go straight through. So I would say, yes, open with Kenny and Brian Danielson. Also, I don't want to see that match have a finish. I know that's weird because, uh, you know, ideally, I want to see everything finish. I want to see um, a definitive ending. But not this one yet. Because I feel like with both of them talking so cocky do i want to see either of them get checked yet um because danielson is he's come in more aggressive than he's ever been uh and it's almost like a a weird contrast because uh when i watched the promo with him and kenny on wednesday i was like i need to just remember where he was when he left wwe so i wouldn't watch the last promo with him and roman and it's like night and day like he is just coming with this fire and aggression and like you know, I know I'm the best in the world. And it's almost like he's never come with that um, pretty much at any point in WWE. I just never saw that of him. Um, but this is a character that probably shouldn't be checked yet because he's, he's you know, he, I think he needs to, um, I think the character doesn't necessarily need to be checked in a sense of um, being humbled but it needs to be checked in a sense of understanding how good Kenny is. And Kenny on the same front, you know, he's a heel. He, he right. Heels kind of have to get checked like that. So uh, what I want to see, ideally, is just a really good barn-burning match that they announce the usual 20-minute time limit that goes to the 20-minute time limit. And by the end of it, because there's a difference between the disqualification and the time limit draw. I feel like a disqual- disqualification kind of cheats you out of like what we thought we were getting. Whereas like a time limit is just like they went the distance. We got, they got as far as this match was going to go under the circumstances that were put in front of them. And therefore that's the match. Uh, and I like that. Yeah. I'm with that. Especially if it's opening, mm-hmm. if it's main event and you do the draw, I think you, I don't want to say, like, you know, put yourself in risk, but I do think it can fail to have that kind of pack the punch it could, you know, as a yeah. t- episode of TV. I will say, though, my prediction remains. I think they've, I think there's something to how much Brian has ignored, like, the other elite members. Yes. <laughs> and I think they're going to him and Adam Cole. So my prediction, and this is just, you know, I, I don't know. I, I'm actually, you kind of talked me into the draw there, but my prediction is still... I think the finish will be Adam Cole costing Brian in some way, and then they'll pivot into that as the full gear match. That's my that's my assumption. Well, I don't there's, know, there's, but I could just see that being a thing. There's one person that uh, I think will be involved in all of this, and I think it'll be a post match thing. But the second that Hangman music hits, uh, right. 
I think the crowd is also going to lose it. But I think that happens post match. Um, I don't know if they're going to Colin Brian or uh, I feel like the one person that Cole has constantly talked up is Christian Cage. And it feels like, especially with the verbal barbs on Dynamite that they were kind of throwing out mm-hmm. there and Christian throwing those out. Um, I could maybe see that first, but I don't know. I have no idea where things are. That's the beauty of it, right? (laughs) I'm just excited. Uh, Like, the card just looks good. It looks, um, I know that that's a word that gets thrown out a lot, is stacked. But this is one of those cases where I genuinely feel that. Um, (laughs) You know what's crazy, though, is, uh, so talking about this week's Dynamite, um, because we did RBR on Tuesday, so I, I haven't had a chance to. This is the first chance I've had to talk about Dynamite at all this week. Um, talking about that show, what was so interesting was uh, so this show was at the um, Prudential Center. And really quick, I want to bring up uh, Antox. I uh, said a reminder that AEW got three appearances and two matches out of Minoru Suzuki. Uh, all have been <laughs> all because of a snafu, and one guy's overreaction on Twitter <laughs> turned into a meme. So uh, I think I just quickly to hit because this is an interesting thing that we've been debating a little bit. I think he was supposed to come back with Archer to beat up the men of the year, yeah, and probably Dan Lambert. And they was like, hmm, "Let's just do <laughs> Mox and Kingston." <laughs> yeah, well, and it's I mean, it's clear that like they definitely pivoted because Kingston was clearly supposed to still be involved with Miro, and now they've just gone full forward with. Um, Miro and Sammy. Uh, and the uh, Mixler chat has asked a couple of questions. Uh, they said, hey, Will, is OC and Matt Hardy hair versus hair going to happen there? I don't think so. If anything, I think that goes to the next week. Um, yes. Because we're the shows we're getting coming up outside of Arthur Ashe are all shows that were rescheduled. These are all shows that people have had tickets to for a really long time. Uh, like the show that aired this week, uh, was at the Prudential Center and that was supposed to be Blood and Guts. Uh, this was the original Blood and Guts show. And, uh, I was worried about this because of the fact that this was originally AEW's biggest gate. And it's crazy that now it's like the third. Uh, but this was originally when the tickets sold. Uh, it was like, oh my God, this is their biggest gate ever. This is the biggest crowd AEW will have had. Um, and... Uh, they're going to do blood and guts in front of this massive crowd. And now, and then as we got closer to it, as they sold all those Arthur Ashe tickets, as they sold the first dance out, then it was like, oh, this is, this is cool, but it's not Arthur (laughs) Ashe. And so that like changed a lot. That changed everything. Um, And so as the card was coming together for this show, a lot of people were like, hey, you know, we were originally the big AEW crowd, and we were supposed to get, like, the big matches, and instead you're giving us Frankie Kazarian versus Adam Cole. And, like, I like Frankie Kazarian, but I recognize what people were seeing in that match. Um, and uh, and I saw just people kind of downing on the card a little bit. And I had worries that the crowd was going to be pissed off with having bought tickets for Blood and Guts and ending up with, 2.0 versus Eddie Kingston and um, John Moxley is the main event. But I think where the show turned things around is that this was pretty much like an all around hype show for Arthur Ashe. And the way it did it, I think kept people really, really engaged. Yeah. And cause like the show of course had Adam Cole versus, um, versus Frankie Kazarian, the first match. And uh, like Frankie Kazarian is such a good hand um, yes. to have for you know he's not a guy that they're necessarily going to and you know sorry I'm gonna bring this up really quick because this is the second time this has happened to me doing the show on Saturdays in case you people can hear the the Zoom sounds going off for whatever reason because it happened two weeks ago my job is just deciding. To have to have to, to to ping me, and I'm not on call today, by the way. But <laughs> to ping me about various things, and like technically, I am I don't have to respond to this till uh, <laughs> till the show is over. But uh, I at least want my Zoom sounds to stop going off, so I am going to mute that. Uh, 
but anyway, yeah, Frankie is such a good hand, you know. Like when Christian came in and the question was, who's Christian going to have his first match against? Like Frankie was a great go-to for that. Yes. Um, he's not necessarily a guy that people believe are going to win, which uh, Paul brought up makes him kind of an ineffective elite hunter. Uh, but as far as the actual use of him is concerned, if you want to have a great match for somebody and you want to debut somebody well, like Frankie is a great pick for that. Uh, and I thought that uh, Adam Cole was was it was good. I I liked it. I liked how over Cole was when that music hit and the crowd lost it. And there were Adam Cole signs and Bay Bay signs and uh and, and people are loving the music. I can't believe you know the AEW themes uh the AEW music YouTube channel only has two videos that went over a million views and it's adam cole's theme and cm punk's theme which wow. like cm punk is cult of personality like yeah. there's literally a million <laughs> other youtube uploads you can find that on i'm shocked that that one's over a million views but uh adam cole's theme like a lot of people are listening to it and a lot of people like it and it just dropped on itunes and whatnot yesterday it's wild because we did we did like a pre-dynamite show Mm -hmm. I'm going to be honest here, as a big fan of AEW, I was a little bit anxious about the show also. Not mm -hmm. for the crowd being angry, but I'll be like, I kind of got some heat for this, but this was my genuine take. Since Rampage has become a thing, my enjoyment of Dynamite has taken like a minor step down. Mm -hmm. So like right before I would have said it was an, a consistent 8, 9 out of 10, and it had become a 7. And people got really mad because they thought I was being like I was hating, but I was just saying, I think it's been less great, which mm -hmm. is like, you know, that's not an insult, right? It is what it is. And I looked at this lineup and I was like, man, I, this feels like another case where Dynamite is just not going to be what it was. This to me was peak Dynamite in the sense that if you <laughs> asked me what the best match or segment was, I'd have been like, I don't know, man, just watch the two hours. It's incredible. Like there's yeah. so much going on. You know, you're an hour into the thing. CM Punk just got laid out and Excalibur's like, we send you now to the gun club. But it's like, this show is insane. And I, and I mean that. It's got a charm to it. Like I love how all over the place. Yeah, it's hectic. It's chaos. Um, it isn't, perfect in the sense that you so you send Suzuki and Artra there for the brawl and if that was on another TV show it would have had this big punctuation point. they would have had this big you know he puts him through the table I mean they just got fought a bit and Jim Ross was like we're out of time please yeah. watch next week like <laughs> he's just I bought the energy of this week's time was great it's my favorite was a dynamite for for a while I have to be honest it, it, I, just, I loved have, it it had some great energy um yeah. and like uh, I I mean people are I've seen people dropping jokes on uh, the Undisputed Era. Um, to quote an Anthony Scats gag, he said the Undisputed Era is officially disputed because, like, the way Cole's kind of come in has been a very, like, the last four years kind of didn't happen. <laughs> I'm yeah. just, like, back where I was. Because, like, he comes in and announces a six-man tag, and he says, the super click is back, baby. And, you know, people got excited for that. They were going to see the Super Click versus Christian Cage and Jurassic Express. And Christian had his backstage segment, and he, he took a couple of shots at Adam Cole. Uh, one about having been in developmental, and the second one about losing the Wednesday Night War. Uh, and, I don't know, I thought they were fun digs. Who cares? Oh, I did too. It's, <laughs> it's interesting on that point about the last four years. I was thinking about this a lot with Gargano, you know, with the news about Johnny Gargano. I was thinking... I loved what NXT was at its best because I just like wrestling in a nice, you know, confined setting. And I love the studio deal. I do like it, but I have to, you know, <laughs> I'm not deluded. Like when you see Adam Cohen in this setting, yes. there is a part of me that thinks the same thing would happen with Gargano where all of the naysayers would see him on Dynamite having a 15 minute opener, rocking the place and would be like, actually, he's good. You know, and mm -hmm. I don't know if that's an indictment on NXT or just a reality of their situations. But like, where are you at on? The it feels like that's a real thing. Right. I'm not a huge Adam Cole fan, but you put him on AEW TV and he feels like the biggest star in wrestling. Like, it's right. insane. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, he does. Um, like, And I don't know where I'm at with Gargano in that uh, I will say the most fun match I've witnessed live was probably Gargano versus Adam Cole. Uh, and so uh, in, in Brooklyn. So... On that side of it, I'm like, I don't know that that uh, Gargano in this setting, because um, the way somebody put it was, weekly dynamites feel like a weekly takeover when you think about like just yeah. the way the crowds are and all of that. And so in that sense, I'm like, yeah, I, I actually could have fun with that. Uh, 
and then on the other end, uh, I don't know. I don't know what to expect out of Gargano if he does choose to to leave. Um, and so this is another thing I want to talk about, and I'm going to steal one of uh, Josh Swallow's points from uh, the RBR neighborhood. Uh, so talking about the MGF or MJF segment uh, where he comes out and cuts the promo on Brian Pillman Jr. and talks to Brian Pillman in hell. Uh, I somebody asked, does it feel like MJF is being de pushed because of the fact that he's in um because of the fact that he is feuding with uh Brian Pillman Jr. right now? And I initially felt like I I've always felt no, but the way Josh put it, and uh to steal his point, Josh said that MJF punching down on somebody actually amplifies who we thought MJF yeah. was this entire time, which is that like Brian Pillman isn't somebody that he should be doing this to. Like you would think it would be somebody that it would be like a main event type guy. But the fact that he's like punching down on Brian Pillman Jr. actually amplifies MJF as uh, somebody MJF is. But before we continue, I want to give room to our caller. Mac from Brooklyn. What's up, Mac? Oh, hold on, Mac. Uh, I just realized that uh, you are muted. So give me just a second because my computer restarted. So all of my settings reset. Uh, so if you are talking, no one can hear you. Go ahead, Mac. I was saying that I went to Dynamite on, on Wednesday. Nice. Great show. Um, my first, well, it was like really my my third wrestling like live show ever, first AEW show. Um, the crowd was amazing. Um, everybody was in pretty much in from the start from me from Elevation all the way to Rampage. Um, I'm definitely thinking about you know buying a, like a last minute ticket like I did for Dynamite Wednesday for this for for Grand Slam. We really my only concern is that it's going to be two hours because. Getting home from, you know, getting home from Newark, that's one thing. From Flushing, you know, on the train, going back to Brooklyn, that's like a two-hour trip. I definitely got work in the morning. Yeah. But um, I felt like it built definitely to the show. It was like a pretty much a go-home show for, for Grand Slam, I felt like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, did you have fun? Because uh, I always – so um, you mentioned this was your – you said your third wrestling show? Third. Third, okay. Live. So one thing that I, I, I've i personally felt uh, when I talk to, because I've been to now, I, I can't believe I could say this in six years, because it's only been, I mean, in two years, because AEW's only been around two years, but I've been to six AEW shows, like Arthur Ashe will be my seventh. Um, but uh, I've also been to, by comparison, like 31 WWE shows. So uh, I, I have a lot of, of shows we could put in there, but... Uh, having been to so many between WWE and AEW, um, I always like to ask people how they feel their experience compared. Because uh, one of the things I do appreciate about AEW is, um, I, I guess, uh, as a thing people kind of use as a fault against them, they have picked up a lot of ex WWE people. But people you don't know that are ex WWE people, like their event coordinator is WWE's event coordinator of, like, seven years. Um, and, like, their event producer, like, the person who produces their live events was WWE's for a really long time. So, like, they picked up a lot of those experienced people. And so I'm curious, how did you feel the experience compared? Um, well, the only only WWE show I went to was the SmackDown after WrestleMania when Kofi won. So, I mean, it was pretty electric for that. I mean, it was pretty much the last – it was, I mean, it was the last day – of the WrestleMania experience, mm-hmm. so that's kind of a, I guess, kind of a not 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 your regular, just you know, regular Raw or SmackDown. But um, I felt like I felt like between that and AEW on Wednesday, I felt like I had a much better time at AEW on Wednesday. I had like much better seats. I guess that kind of played into it. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't get to sit with my friends because they had tickets all the way back from when it was, the show was originally supposed to be in March of t- 2020. So I mean, I had to sit with them for Dynamite. I mean, so for, for Rampage. But um, I felt like, you know, interactions, things like that, you know, I felt like it felt like when I went to the felt like when I went to go see All Out in the bar, 
kind of, and I wasn't expecting that, you know, just because, you know, you go to the show, you know, you're expecting to kind of be by yourself. But there was a lot more interaction. I pretty much heard Adam Cole, baby, all the way from Newark, all the way today, train back in Manhattan. <laughs> nice. Like over and over and over again. So, I mean, it felt like a much hype, much hyper crowd. It felt like a much more connected, much more connected community with AEW versus WWE. So I'm the odd man out here because I haven't been to an AEW show for obvious reasons, right? But the fit, the word that always comes from when I'm watching from home is there is a sense of optimism to the experience of watching AEW, whether it's live, whether it's with your friends at home, whether it's at a bar. There's this sense that, like, people are there to have a good time. Now, before I go, this is not me saying it's the opposite of WWE, but there is an almost a caution with people having fun at WWE. Does that make sense, this idea that I don't want to give them my whole heart? With AEW, it feels a lot more kind of full-fledged to me. Because people just go there and just want to have fun. Uh, we actually lost him. Uh, oh. so, damn. Yeah, he <laughs> like, like point, midway right? through we'll... your talking, uh, we lost our caller. Uh, thanks is for the is call. that fair to say, though? You know, the, the optimism deal? Yeah, um, well, like, I think it's more so, especially for, like, those post-WrestleMania crowds. Um, yeah. Because there you're dealing with, uh, you know, what what they'll call like a smart audience, I guess. Uh, I don't know what that is anymore. But um, I will say that, oh, here's my, my, my brother-in-law making his cameo again, um, <laughs> as he does. Um, but anyway, uh, the I, I feel like... It, part of it is the fact that WWE has a bit of an adversarial relationship with that yes. audience. And so when that audience gets in front of WWE television, they're like, all right, you know, we're ready to send a message to Vince. You know, the, the message we want to like, they're there to, to almost. Yeah, that's what I'll say. To send a message to yeah. to the company. Whereas on the other end, I feel like. uh just the AEW's audience isn't there. They're not necessarily there to to send a message. The, like the message they want to send is, "We're here to cheer these guys." Like and that's earned. To be clear, like yeah. that's very much as you said. You lay that public. That is not a coincidence. Yeah, right. that's a result of many, many. But it is it is something that stands out to me. That kind of sense of now. What's interesting, and you you probably have a better read on this than, than anyway. You've been to a lot of WWE shows. I don't know when the last time you went was, but I. I'm, I'm always intrigued by this this growing idea that the WWE crowds have changed somewhat since AEW's arrival. Meaning, it appears to me, when they went to Chicago most recently, that there was some CM Punk chance, and I know mm-hmm. they sweetened the crowds. But it does feel to me like there's a growing portion of the audience that's just like, I'm cool, I won't go. <laughs> and <laughs> is that a thing? Do you think that's an AEW well, thing where they're like, we have our own, we have a promotion, we enjoy it, leave it. Yeah, well, I, I, I think the biggest proof of that is: Have you looked at the um, the Long Island sales? Um, yes, yeah. it's it's. I feel like that's like the biggest apples to apples, like demand um, argument that's ever been made. Uh, because you know, you you've seen the debates on Twitter of like you know with the the demo victory for AEW and then the question of, well, they're not on the same nights. Like you can't really compare. Right. But like the one thing you absolutely can compare is that they are both, both companies running UBS arena, um, a brand new arena. So like it is, it's the newest arena in America. It's supposed to be fully state of the art. It's supposed to be one of the best experiences. They say you can have in an arena. Um, They've talked up the fact that the arena is going to be fully um, powered by renewable energy within, um, uh, by like 2024 and like it's a really state-of-the-art arena in yeah. long island and both AEW and wwe wanted to get in on the ground floor the arena doesn't even open till november um wwe is actually the first non-hockey event at the arena uh and wwe hits there i believe november 29th and AEW is there nine days later on uh no or december 8th and Ticket sales, it's like five to one. Um, in that, I believe as of right now, WWE hasn't even sold a thousand tickets for it yet. Right. AEW sold like five thousand tickets for theirs, and it's uh, it's the exact same venue, the exact same setup, um, and just in the same area. The fact that the demand is higher 
for an AEW event right now with then Raw. And this isn't like a house show. It's Raw. It's Raw and Dynamite, nine days apart from each other. And uh, the sales are, are, and it's a different sales strategy though. You know, the AEW is like, we're going to sell on social media, which when you sell on social media, you're getting the audience that comes with social media. Whereas WWE is more like, let's sell locally. Let's do local advertising. Let's do, you know, ads on TV and whatnot. And it does definitely bring a different type of audience when you do that. But again, this is like a true apples to apples comparison. Yeah. And I'm, uh, I'm fascinated by just, you know, you mentioned the kind of the ongoing like counter argument, right? It's like, you know, they win the demo and it's, well, Monday football. And all that. <laughs> right. How far are these goalposts going to move? Am I going to be coming back on the show in a year and they're going to be beating them in the, in the viewership and people will go, yeah, but, you know, it's free hours. So you have to get, like, I, I just, look, we all agree being on Mondays should be on Wednesday. We don't need to be at the next to explain to us, right? We understand. Mm-hmm. But it feels lost on some folks that appears of ours. Like, AEW's two years old, guys. Yeah. I, like, <laughs> the fact is, it is absolutely a. It is a point that, regardless of whether you say uh, it's the NFL, they're on different days of the week, whatever. Mm-hmm. The fact is, there is because yeah, I I I I don't think it's something that can that should be like sat and debated and all of that stuff. None of that matters. It's just the fact that a two year old company can stand up and go, "We have the number one wrestling show on cable TV two weeks in a row." Yeah. That's it. There's nothing else that needs to be said there. Like the fact that that can be said for a two year old wrestling company, like exactly. WWE, at two years. Um, obviously way different time, but okay, let's, let's take a step back. Cause I'm not going to go there. WCW at two years, um, was not there. Uh, WCW got there and it was still impressive that WCW, um, built up over time as, uh, as the acquisitions took place. And, um, but I'm talking strictly WCW as a new brand in the late eighties, um, as they got there. And just taking a look at some of the the chat messages, uh, Evan Wright talking about, uh, but it's different days. You can't compare, of course, using quotes, uh, <laughs> because he knows. Um, and uh, and TNA never got there. I mean, yeah. TNA was their own worst enemy. I, I I one day want to do an entire just like podcast breakdown on please please on get TNA me <laughs> <laughs> on uh, like it's something I've always wanted to do on like. Because it's weird, I'm talking about a company that still exists, but I still want to do like a post mortem on TNA. Like, what exactly did they miss and get wrong? Uh, because there's a lot of things that they missed that were kind of in their lap, and they. Well, I just I, and people that watch the distraction again be like, "Oh God, Joe's going there again." So I apologize, <laughs> folks. But the TNA thing fascinates me because don't we both know that the general perception is they were rolling, and then Hogan and Bischoff came in, and it's like. That was very much Dixie, like, rolling the dice because they just wasn't really growing. Like, if you look at their – I mean, seriously, look at AEW's pay-per-view buyers since, it's, you know, two years. TNA were having, like, 1.5 million viewers and translating to 12,000, 10,000 pay-per-view <laughs> right. buyers. Now, I get they had one every month, but good lord, 12,000. Right, 10, well, so insane. here's the thing about those – the TNA that I think – People miss when they because I I've seen the points brought in of like yeah AEW is bringing in um Brian Danielson and they brought in CM Punk but like TNA right. brought in Hogan and Nash and um all and Kurt Angle and all these stars so like and those are bigger stars than AEW ever brought in here's the difference and this is somebody who not only lived through all of that but podcasted through all of that I did shows about all of this stuff at the time. The mentality around all of that in TNA at the time was with each thing TNA brought in, it was supposed to fix whatever the problem yes. was in TNA. <laughs> Everything was supposed to be a fix. Kurt Angle coming in was like, uh, you know, this show really sucks, but man, when Kurt Angle gets there, this is going to be really great. You know, Hogan and Bischoff were brought in to revamp the show. It was a exactly. reboot. Yeah. It wasn't. Hogan and Bischoff coming in because this promotion's so hot that they have to be there. This was 
this show is floundering again. It needs Eric Bischoff and Hogan to turn things around. None of the nothing TNA ever got was because of how hot it was. It was always to repair it, and it was always to fix it. It was always to change the perception of TNA, but it was never because TNA was a hot product. And that's the difference between CM Punk coming here because it's a hot product and um, Hogan coming in because it's not a hot product, but they think it can become one. And like, yeah, it's also just watch the shows, man. Yeah. Right? I know mean, it's an easy like, guys. A lot of TNA's like golden era was in the Impact Zone, and like, yeah, those fans bless them; they did their best. Mm-hmm. How can you compare that to some of the stuff we've seen at AEW as of late, man? Like, I, I know it's dismissive, and I don't mean it that way. Bless TNA, they tried their best, and they, they shot themselves in the foot an awful lot. I'm glad they can still walk, but good <laughs> lord, man, it ain't the same thing. And if you watch those shows, you watch Dynamite now, you'll know that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, I, I think it is just uh, a. There is a big difference uh, between the two. Um, I guess just a little bit more with uh, with Dynamite. Um, so, yeah, I, I like the MJF segment. I think it was weird and probably a mistake that they played the Brian Pillman promo after. I think that should have gone yes. before. And uh, I think that was just things kind of out of order uh, on that show. Um and you know what? I should probably have results because I'm like trying to do all of this from memory. <laughs> and... Out of interest, why, why you pull that? What, where are you at on Pillman as a singles? I'm I'm not huge on him personally. I kind of think this is a deal where CM Punk has convinced Tony Khan that he's very good, which we'll, we'll see about that. I don't know. Um, where are you at on him thus far? This I, I don't think it's just him. CM Punk. I think a lot of people um, mm. like Brian Pillman. You hear it from so many guys in the back that. Uh, you know, they see just potential in Brian Pillman. And granted, I don't know what that is, but I also listen to like other podcasts where um, hosted by wrestlers and the wrestlers go like, yeah, you know, Brian Pillman, he's going to be, he's going to be a star. Right. That guy looks like a star. I thought, really? Like the mullet? Like that's, that's for you. Okay. Um, I don't get it. And I, I'm <laughs> like, I've had the same experience you where it's like, am I missing something? I was yeah. intrigued with it. Yes. There you go. So, um, and then there was the uh, Dante Martin and Matt Seidel versus FTR. Uh, you know, again, FTR is fascinating to me because they've been protected, like really protected. And that uh, to the point of where you kind of see a lot of FTR fans a little bit upset that they're not used as much as they could be. Um, whereas I, I recognize what it is with FTR. FTR is one of those cases where they very much see both of them as, like, a top-tier tag team. But FTR, not in a position to be tag team champions right now when there are other guys that should be tag team champions. And the issue is when you have a system in place that is designed to get people to tag team championship victories, it's like, how do we keep FTR away from the tag titles but also not have them lose? And so, like, the only way you can do that is to put them in situations where they're not necessarily um, competing in tag action. Like, you had FTR, you had um, Dax Harwood have that great match with Jungle Boy. They've mostly, they've been in a lot of, like, multi-person matches uh, where they had the tag match with Sean Spears that, like, wouldn't count toward uh, tag team victories. And it, like, essentially keeps them away from the tag titles. Because if you were to ask me what team should be tag champions, not them. That's my answer. Like, I don't think... Uh, but also, you don't want to do the Bucks rematch either. Like, there's there's a lot of factors, but they've been, like, protected really well. I do think that they're probably headed toward the Lucha Bros now. Um, but in the meantime, uh, I don't know. I feel like they are extremely protected. But also, another protected person is Dante Martin. They have... Uh, you know, he gets put out there to just look excellent and just get the crowd going and he always does oh he's great yeah quickly on ftr because this is something i've been thinking about a lot recently because i'm a huge fan of this okay now if you ask me my favorite aw tag team if all things are equal it's probably them i don't think they're the best tag team in AEW. they're just my particular like personal taste wise right mm-hmm. i think they've been very good and i, I love that they're wrestling sting next week that's one of the, that's just hilarious to me i love it i don't think they are 
as perfectly suited to the AEW, this is not a phrase I like, I'm going to use it, house style as I, in my brain, thought before they got there. And what I mean by that is I like their match with Santana and Ortiz. In that setting, I think they're objectively like more exciting matches out there. Mm -hmm. Now, this is very, again, I say this with like a heavy heart because I love these guys, but like Santana and Ortiz versus the Lucha Bros would get over more in front of an AEW audience, especially in the kind of match they'd have than I think FTR versus either of those teams. Now, that's not an insult. They're two great teams also, right? But I think we're in a position where, and Evan talks about, you know, the tag team depth. Like, it's not an insult. I just don't think they're as, I mean, they're as good as the Young Bucks, man. (laughs) (laughs) And if they were listening to this, they would block me. So, all how I get it. (laughs) Like, the versatility that the Bucks showed as champions, Okay. I think they would have had great matches with King and Moxley and they would have had great matches with a lot of those teams, but I don't think they would have had the television range or have been as exciting as the Young Bucks, you know? Mm-hmm. And that's not an insult. I think the Young Bucks could be the greatest team ever. But do you think there's something to that? Like, they still don't feel completely at home to me stylistically, which is weird because I thought the contrast would make it better. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm playing for this a little bit recently. Yeah, no, okay. That's, that's a, I hadn't thought about that um, right. as far as feeling at home. Uh, because I I do like FTR as well, and I think when FTR has delivered, they have delivered. But I do think that where FTR delivers is with teams like um, like my favorite FTR matches have been with guys like Jurassic Express, with the Young yeah. Bucks themselves, uh, with the Lucha Bros. They actually did have a great match with the Lucha Bros, um, and I would love to see them revisit that with... Uh, with the like play off the ending of the last match um uh, where remember dax harwood ripped off um ray phoenix's mask and then rolled him up for a victory and like <laughs> i would love to see something silly like i wait they, they did that didn't they i was like wwe did that once where ray mysterio wore two masks and chris jericho snatched off ray's mask and then looked yeah. at him and he still had a mask on <laughs> and uh so maybe don't do that because that's already been done but do something fun to play off of yeah. that idea of we saw that coming because we know that that's what you're going to go for um and uh i don't know i i i think that ftr is i still think they're in a better position than they were because they're just in a place with more tech and depth yeah. um but yeah they're definitely not the standout act that I think everybody thought they would be simply because um, there's much more exciting stuff out there. Yeah, and that's fine, right? If you're on a, you know, I always use the dumb sports comparison of if you're on a, a championship team, you may take less shots. It doesn't mean you're not good. It means there's better <laughs> there's other players yeah. out there. Like, I don't, I don't mean it as an insult to them. It's just, let's be honest, this is my stack tag division in recent memory. And with that comes a situation where there are going to be teams you could build divisions around that ain't getting divisions built around. I think Centennial and Ortiz, I love those guys. But them not being champs says a lot about the division, right? Like, yeah. it's there's a lot going on there. So it's just different things to, to fit in. It's, I was, but again, I say all of that with complete full disclosure that I am so pumped to see them get some heat on Derby and then feed a sting hot tail. I can't wait. For that. <laughs> I'm, I'm so fired up there, man. Oh, me too. I'm, like, really excited for that. Uh so, really, the only other things I wanted to touch on from Dynamite were um, the uh, Jade Cargill had her longest match um, ever, and I uh, and I liked that Layla Hirsch was kind of the one to take her a little bit further than she's ever been. Uh, so that was cool. Um, we. There wasn't much else to talk about there, other than the fact that I, I am intrigued by the fact that there is now multiple women's angles going on in the company. That you know, one of the biggest things that people talk about is that um, beyond just like match times and things like that, because AEW actually does give women's matches uh, yeah. a decent amount of time; they just only give them one. Um, but the but the idea that AEW never doesn't necessarily ever want run women's programs outside of the title picture and right. so this is kind of the first time that we're seeing like multiple things happening within the women's division and there's only one thing centering around the women's title but other than that everything else that's happening is happening outside of it um like you have nyla rose and um and jade cargill have their thing brewing you have yep. the bunny and 
uh, and Penelope Ford versus uh, Anna Jay and Ty that Conti. Got, oh, I thought they were going to do the tag next week, mm-hmm. but the fact they're doing another singles, they're going to extend that yeah, even gonna further, con- right? Yeah, so. and continue to extend that. And then you have the women's title picture. Right. Uh, Where are you at? You, you mentioned FTR. Are, um, you mentioned that's the problem of not having them win enough that they have to be fighting for the belts. You know, that, that, that rankings dilemma. Right. Where are you at on that with Jade? Which yeah, is starting to worry so me a that's lot. that's really interesting. Well, so the cool thing, again, is uh, the way that Mark Sterling continues to put it is that we will go after the title when we want to. So it becomes a case of you can almost promote this as like it's Jade's title when she chooses. Right. And so if she chooses to stay at bay because she's not, she doesn't feel like she wants to yet, but the second she does, you guys are in trouble. Like, that's a good angle to play it at. Um, and you can continue to do that, continue to have her win. But she is ultimately choosing not to exercise her right to go after the title. I, I like that, actually. I just, <laughs> with her, it's a thing of we all get the raw ingredients, right? Looks mm-hmm. like Star has this presence. It's getting her to a point where you don't you don't expose her in a way. Like, I thought the lay of the match... The first time I watched it, I didn't like it much at all. I rewatched it and I was, I was higher on it. Um, I'm sorry if you can hear this sound, folks. Neighbors, baby screaming, I'm sorry. But I, um, I, there are signs to me that like they need to be careful with it. You know, yeah. like her selling on Wednesday, I was a little, I just, and again, it's not a big deal. Man. She's a rookie. You know, like she, she's, <laughs> this is like isn't absolutely rookie. People, like her first match was in February. Yeah. Like, this isn't and, like, so it makes sense that she has holes in her game, right? Yeah. Like it's, but it's that, it's that situation of how do we make her a star and not kind of just make her another part of the roster without putting her in a position to foul? Mm-hmm. That's all we're balancing out with these things, and that was the problem you were always going to run into when you debuted her with Shaq. Like you yeah. bring her in at this, you know. Layla is great. I really would have been tempted. I tweeted about this. Well, I, I really would have been tempted to have Layla upset her. I yeah, really would. I, I would have too. I was thinking AEW is yeah. really good about hometown stuff. Yeah. And but I feel like that was exactly why um, Tony Khan tweeted what he did last week about how like hometown people yeah. aren't always gonna wait you know, like temporary expectations because mm-hmm. we may have one coming up real soon where they're not going to. I think Kingston may fit that too. I don't know if Suzuki's losing twice, mm-hmm. so I could see. Uh, like, do you want to be Archer there? Who wins that match? The lights out. Do how do you do that? I don't know. I mean, the cool thing is, wins and losses matter, and in this case, this one won't count. But yeah. uh, so there's a lot you can do there. I have no idea. And the beauty is, it's going to close out too. That's the last match we're getting of the entire night. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I, I don't know. Um, the the Brian Danielson, uh, Kenny Omega segment. God, I, I feel like. I don't know what it was, but something was just clicking with Kenny as far as like his demeanor, his look, like to the point of where when he had that stare down with Brian and like this, when I feel like we throw the term dream match around a lot uh, and somewhat loosely over the last few years, but this was a match that for years I was literally dreaming about. Uh, This was a match that I used to come up with scenarios with. I tweeted a poll out about a year ago of like, if we were to ever see Brian Danielson versus Kenny Omega, where does it occur? And I said, does it occur in WWE? Do they somehow meet in Japan? Or would they meet in AEW? Where do you think this match occurs? Or, and I put the final option, the match never happens. And the poll, the option that won the poll was the match never happens. Like, it was literally a dream match. If people were like, I don't see a scenario where Brian Danielson ever faces Kenny Omega. Uh, not again. Um, and not as these two guys. And so, like, this is a match where I just, I always wanted to see it. And I wanted to see it with the best bout machine versus, you know, Brian, who's been at the top of the wrestling industry, his main event at WrestleMania. Like, this is what I've wanted to see for a long time. And when that stare down happened, I was just, I thought, it's happening. This is it. We're actually getting Brian Danielson versus Kenny Omega. It's crazy, too, because this is the luxury of having the roster they have, which is like an all-time great roster. Mm-hmm. Is I think they're, they're obviously going to run this back for the belt, whether it's at full gear or next year. Like They're going to do it. For something, not even in for the belt. Just they're going to do it again. Right? It's not going to be a one-off. But... Mm-hmm. 
you can basically burn this match knowing that in your back pocket you've got like you can do Omega and Punk as a major program at any point. That's a huge deal, right? Yes. You're obviously eventually going to build a Cohen Omega in some form or fashion. Another one that could last three to six months as a program. <laughs> yes. If a, if a you know, certain uh, current WWE main event or his contract indeed expires when we believe it expires and he heads over to AEW, I think he's an inevitable Omega match, right? Yes, absolutely. I mean, this is when you... And I know there's been lots about hot shotting and bless those people. Um, you know, <laughs> but... <laughs> In, in 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 truth, this is why you pay the big bucks to talent level they've got. Because you can actually do... Like, this match you just built up perfectly into our great dream matches, and I agree with everything you said. They can really just be like, yeah, we're going to do it on TV, and we've got, like, five other great Kenny matches in our yeah. back pocket. Like, <laughs> incredible. So it's awesome, mate. It really is refreshing. Like, they've got themselves in a position where they can't lose almost. They've got so many great pieces at play. Just pick which one you want. <laughs> it's fine. So exciting. Yeah, I was just, I, I was over the moon by the time the segment ended, and I was like nudging my wife. I'm like, "This is the thing I'm going to go to next week, and I'm going to see a match that." And, and again, I just trust. I just bought these tickets, thinking, yeah. "I just want to see a cool setting." Not, I want to see a match between my all-time favorite wrestler and a guy I truly do consider the best in the business right now. And I'm just going to get to see that in person. I am just, uh, I, I can't believe this is happening. I can't believe this is actually happening. Um, and, uh, you know, um, Rob in the chat brought up Phoenix versus Brian. How do you feel about that? Are you kidding me? That's Phoenix versus anyone, Brian versus anyone. You put them together, it's outrageous, right? In- incredible me. I think Brian's got a bloodbath in him against Penta, though, which he's definitely going to find a way to do, and it's going to rule so much, you know? Like, I can see that, too. So, <laughs> it's Brian, man. I'll see wrestle anyone. Same with Phoenix. Yeah, we are already... Je- I, I'm sorry. I, I don't mean to put this out there as a lot. I just, no, I just took a chance. Because, you know, I, I get shit for buying tickets to, to uh, events because it's, it's my hobby and I have fun with going to pro wrestling shows um and oh i will say though that i my travel um is officially not nearly as agonizing as i thought it was going to be so i think i said on the show that uh the plan was to just land in queens go to the event and then head back to the airport uh, <laughs> and uh, i recognized that that was going to be um, a very obnoxious way to <laughs> try to travel. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Big <laughs> uh, But Anthony Scats um, let me know that he's also going, and uh, I think he posted that, and we talked about it, and he was like, hey, I want to split a hotel. And I was like, actually, that sounds like a great idea because I'm going to be exhausted as hell. And, yeah. uh, and then also, where was I going to put my stuff? If I did, if I did what I was gonna do, um, and so yes, Scott's and I we got a hotel and it's in Queens, and so this works out much better and I'm much happier than what I was going to attempt to do, which is just wing it. Uh, right. So I I am very happy with that. Uh, and then on the other end of things, there was uh, Rampage, uh, which saw the Butcher and the Blade take on um, the tag champions, the Lucha Bros. Uh, and, you know, Rampage is kind of a backward show in the sense, and I get why it is, yeah. uh, just in the sense that the the most watched portion of the show tends to be the opener. And because of that, uh the main event as it were tends to be the first match on rampage not the last yeah. and that i feel like that's very much what we got here uh out of the lucha bros i feel like this, just them having their first tag title defense felt like a bigger deal right. than anything else i think rampage and this may be a criticism to some it's a, it's a feature more than it is a flaw for me personally but i think it's quickly becoming the 
if, the, if there was an hour in between the first and, and second of Dynamite, you know, if you could cushion an extra hour of Dynamite in there to let things breathe a bit, that's what this is. Mm-hmm. None of us want Dynamite to be three hours, though, so this is obviously the best alternative, yeah. and Tony Khan said as much. Like, to me, this was a chance to... I think a lot of the stuff that happens on Rampage isn't so much a necessity. It's them taking advantage, again, of how great their roster is. So, like, you get yourself this Lucha Bros tag title defense that, you know, it's for, I might, maybe I'm wrong, but it's basically a match for sake of a match. And that's fine, right? I want to see Penta and Phoenix wrestle on television. Fuego and Miro, they, they run back. You get yourself the extra women's match, which is big time important for that division. Like, that whole Anna J, Ty, Penelope, Bunny deal is all being helped by the fact there's a second show for them to, you know, tie it together. Yeah, so absolutely. It's just, it's like an extension to Dynamite to me. And I know that's how they're taping it right now. And again, some people might say, well, it feels much like a B show. Like for me, I love this just an hour of wrestling. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> Will, it's inevitably going to be two hours of wrestling by like next year. Like they're going to do that because it's just, that's TV. But for now, man, I'm loving just having an hour block of AEW. Like, oh, it's so much fun. Yeah. And I, I, uh, it's a really digestible show, and it's not like nothing's happening on the show because right. yeah, we get the because uh, we had the opener, um, which I thought was was creative. They had a great ending, I thought, uh, and just I I had fun with it, uh, and then of course uh, the other members of the HFO run in, which leads to uh, Santana and Ortiz. Uh, coming in for the save. And I feel like this hopefully starts planting the seeds of doing Santana and Ortiz versus the Lucha Bros. Uh, But for now, we're going to see the eight-man tag, uh, which gets them um, all four of those teams on the show next week. Uh, We did have the women's match, um, which there wasn't much to. There wasn't a whole lot to discuss other than the fact that there's, there's a program here. Uh, yeah. And the thing I genuinely appreciate about the program is that these teams, at least as somebody who is like way too in the AEW verse of um, following all the vlogs and stuff, yeah. um, I at least very much appreciate that these are all real life best friends, right? Like we know that yeah. uh, Penelope Ford and Bunny are like super tight. That they are yes. best friends. That that's a believable friendship. That this doesn't necessarily feel, at least to me, like a thrown together tag team. And mm-hmm. then we've seen Anna Jay and Ty Conti be uh, joined at the hip for a year now. So we are seeing two sets of friends going at it with each other, and it's believable. Well, I think, you know, and I think the bunny is. Look, I know the bunny has her critics, and that's whatever. But like, I think she's objectively a good character wrestler you know if you give her some sort of personality to like i mean look at the difference between like ali and this character she plays now right she can i think she's helping penelope in the sense that sometimes with penelope i didn't feel like she was she emoted enough or she was she had the edge she needed to have like, she has all the tools i think penelope mm-hmm. right like if you said you're you're like me you're deep in the vlog verse um She's she's like so soft spoken and yeah. quiet. Sometimes in that first year of Dynamite or so, like her actions would be that of a great villain, but she didn't have the conviction to me that I wanted to see. Yeah. The Bunny, I think, is bringing it out of her because, as you said, they have that chemistry and they're comfortable around each other. So that's nice to see. Um, it, it what's also surprising is yeah. how much Bunny has been used this year. Uh, yes. In that that first year, she wasn't really used at all. She had that first match with. Um, with Brandy, and then she was basically with the Butcher and the Blade, and she wasn't really used much. And then right. in 2021, she is just, I feel like, I have to look this stat up, because I may just be talking out of my ass, but is she behind Brit for the most TV matches this year? She's got to be close. Yeah, <laughs> I, I feel so. like she has to be. Um, yeah. Just in terms of, because she keeps getting TV matches. She had, um, I know she faced Chris Statlander, and she had this mixed tag yeah. with her and Blade versus Statlander and uh, and Orange Cassidy, and she faced Red Velvet, and she's faced... Uh, twice, twice on TV, I think she's she, faced twice. She faced Anna Jay, obviously, last night, yeah. It's, yeah, I, I feel like there's there's been matches for Bunny this year. Uh, so I am curious. I have to look that stat up to be certain. Um, right. But, of course, the segment that had, I think, the most chatter was Ruby Soho and Britt Baker. 
uh, going at it, uh, their verbal joust, um, throwing some good digs at each other. Um, and the, <laughs> and of course, uh, uh, it's Joe. <laughs> The first five seconds of big money match. Scene. How great was it, Will, last night? That so obviously he was out there for the first thirty-five minutes of the show. Yes, and the bunny did her own entrance, obviously for her match. And you could see that Matt stayed at ringside because he was like, "I'm not walking that ramp twice. You, there's no way I'm staying here at ringside. She can meet me in the ring." <laughs> Bless Matt Hardy. By the yeah. way, when they do that match, him and Orange hair versus hair. Mm-hmm. Everyone online is going to go crazy. This is a terrible main event, and it's going to do a great number because all of Matt Hardy's matches do, and it's hair versus hair. Like, let's be honest, man. He's going to make a great meme of him being bald. Yeah, and it's going to be it's going to be <laughs> tremendous. Like, let's not even pretend otherwise. It'll be fun. <laughs> yeah, uh, I suppose for the sake of this being a Joel Holbert appearance, we'll let him have it. <laughs> there we go. I don't know how I feel about that being my brand. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Um, so the uh, w- what else? Uh, but yeah, so the, we had that segment. Um, I thought the digs were really good. I wasn't sure what they were going to be, uh, but I was glad that there was a rebuttal for each one. That uh, you know, I was never a big fan of bringing up Britt Baker's relationship with Adam Cole as a dig without Adam Cole there because, uh, because, you know, they've done it before in the big swole feud, it was brought up. Um, but that's with Adam Cole over on the other channel. When he is backstage, I feel a little bit better about it because then it's just like, Hey, it's just all within the fun of this show. And then I liked, uh brit's comeback of like you call yourself the runaway but you didn't run away from anything you got fired and then i liked her comeback of uh that's very true but if i hadn't been um it's the best thing that ever happened to me because that put me right here in AEW in front of all these fans and like turn the negative into a positive uh ultimately i i liked i liked it i i i thought that this was kind of the verbal joust that again um, the women's divisions kind of needed. Only thing I didn't like about it, and I hope one day I get a version without it, was commentary uh, between each remark going, oh, this is a great segment. Like, shut the fuck up, Chris Jericho. Yeah. Uh, yeah it's, it's, and then afterwards, he did a line where he was like, that was a money segment. And I was like, oh, God, uh, man. Yeah. This is... Ugh. But yeah, I'm, I'm with you. But I think it was just... It was validating, right, as a fan of Ruby. Because mm-hmm. anytime she got a chance to talk, she nailed it in WWE TV, and she just never got a chance to talk. <laughs> she yeah. would she would cut a great promo, and she wouldn't hear her talk for six months. And it's like, you know, I, that's that's a, that's a, another talk for another day. But it was just nice to see her prove everyone right that with a brain that she obviously can do this stuff in a, ma- in a major way. Mm-hmm. I thought she was great in that segment. And as you said, the women's division needs these kind of promo segments. It can't just be Brit talk in one way you know it has to be a, it has to be a battle it has to be a conflict so yeah i absolutely agree yeah uh, so i i was i was definitely a big fan of that yeah. and then uh and then the main event um and i guess i for whatever reason it wasn't clicking with me but uh and i don't know why because duh but <laughs> the fact that it's time to do sammy versus miro uh yeah. and this is like the perfect scenario to set that up because you set up the sympathy for Sammy having somebody he cares very much about and Miro taking advantage of that. I loved, I loved the showdowns with Mark Henry. I, I'm actually kind of glad that, and I, it wouldn't surprise me if it was a Mark Henry decision of like step away from commentary directly, but do these interview segments. Like I'm at the point where I can absolutely see the, uh, the crowd catching on to Mark Henry's looking directly in the camera going, it's time for the main yes. event. Like Apparently that happened. I read someone on social say that the crowd did it with him. Oh. So there you go. It's maybe someone in the chat was there, very sure, or under a corner <laughs> or whatever, but I heard that's a thing. That's going to happen. So that's awesome. Yeah. I absolutely love it. Yeah. <laughs> it's such a great thing. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I liked uh, of course, Miro is just the best to me. I just yeah. love Miro. His line of, uh, I only serve my God above and my wife below. 
uh, was so great. <laughs> uh, and uh, the fact that he didn't care about the car, um, but he just wants to beat him one more time. Yeah. Yes, it was. I, I liked the match. I would have. He's just been very nitpicky, but I would have tightened up a little bit. And and I say this a lot. Sometimes about AEW, my experience of not having like the picture in picture for me is still full screen. You know, mm. so that part can sometimes extend stuff for me in a way that probably lessens my enjoyment. I still liked it. I love the semi direction. I actually think like, I wouldn't do it because I love Miro as much as you, but. I would be tempted by Sammy winning the title. I'm going to be honest with you. Like, I, I almost tweeted yeah. it. I thought, you know what? I, I like Miro as champion, but right. if there's one kind of like smaller underdog guy that I would have beat him, it would be Sammy Guevara. Absolutely. He's so over, and this beyond, like, I don't want to say he's underutilized, but he hasn't been on TV a bunch as of late, and they love him. The people go crazy for Sammy. Um, I don't want to derail this any further than I already have, but I must say that the, my highlight of Rampage was a 30-second segment, which was the Hobbs video package. Yes, yeah. Uh, oh, oh, my God. My, dude, he came across like an absolute megastar in that he thing, didn't did. he? Holy shit, that's incredible. <laughs> yeah, no, that was great, too. I completely forgot about that. Uh, again, right. I'm trying to do all this from memory. But, um, the, uh, and luckily, I just happened to just watch it yesterday. Uh, right. So, no, I, I was, I, I, you know, CM Punk, mentioning his list of guys that he wanted to work with and some felt outlandish to me like i thought okay what you know i could see him seeing potential in hobbs but like when is it ever gonna happen and and like oh next that's exactly where it is next and so uh i genuinely do see him working through that list of guys that he's talked about over the because he mentioned ricky starks that's obviously a great next step to go with uh and uh, who else did he mention? He mentioned Jungle Boy. Like, there's there's places this can go. And yeah. uh, the fact that everybody's going to look better for having been in there with Punk is... It just feels great. I'm I'm happy. I'm happy for Absolutely. Hobbs. Um, especially because uh, not to remove some of the, uh, the mystery around Hobbs, I suppose, but... That is a man who is very happy to be where he's at right now and is having the time of his life. And mm-hmm. just thinking about uh, where he is right now and who he is and that he would be happy just being on TV, let alone working with CM Punk. Are you kidding me? At all for Ash Stadium? At Arthur <laughs> Ash Stadium. <laughs> no, I, I, I just I was talking about this week, like, as a big fan of his, I'm so excited for him, but I just, I'm fascinated to see what it looks like, you know, because I think if he hits in the way that I believe he can, he will be accelerated even more than he has been in recent. Because it feels to me since Cage has been taken out of the group, which I think was strategic because I think they want to move Hobbs up. <laughs> yes. Like, I feel like they're really kind of focusing on this idea that, yeah, this this guy's he's, he's a player, you yeah. know? Well, cause and that I, segment I, said why perfectly. I kind of feel on the topic of uh, of Brian Cage that the members they added to Team Taz somewhat exposed him in yeah. that when they first added uh, Ricky Starks, you know, Ricky Starks cut that promo the very next week that was like, oh, damn, well, he's a much more charismatic, much better talker than Brian Cage. So that kind of takes away that factor from Brian Cage. And then they brought in Will Hobbs, and it's like, well, okay, between the two, uh, if I wanted to have a dominating powerhouse wrestler, Hobbs is kind of the guy to me. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's all, the thing I love when Hobbs when Hobbs turned, he kind of tapped into that like Tyson deal, right? The mm-hmm. snarl and the, the way – yeah. remember when he first came out with the Tyson-style like, towel? Mm-hmm. And um, bless Brian Cage. He has never been able to capture that kind of aura, right? He's never had this sense of like that's a like he's a you know a killer out there. He's a guy that does some cool moves and he's he's he does some awesome stuff. I'm not you know knocking the guy, but he ain't got that aura of of a, of a monster to me. And as you said, Hobbs, he took that away straight away. Yeah. Uh, did you get a chance to watch SmackDown? I did just just for you, Will. I, yes, <laughs> I tried my best. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't so, know, man. Yeah, so it's, I didn't watch it, watch. and. Um... You know, SmackDown is a show that uh, has a lot going for it, um, and 
uh, I, I absolutely get what the appeal of SmackDown is because it, it does appeal to me in a lot of ways. Um, the only things that really hurt me about SmackDown are the amounts of wasted time. Um, and the show does a lot of it because, uh, you know, SmackDown opened up with uh, the video package recapping Edge and Seth Rollins. And then uh, Roman's music hits and he starts making his way down to the ring slowly in my least favorite entrance in pro wrestling. But uh, my, I got encouraged by the fact that I'm like, okay, they're going to show this video package. They showed a recap of what happened the previous week. And I'm like, and he'll already be in the ring. So at least we don't have uh, this this Roman Reigns entrance. And they come back and he's only like halfway down the ramp. Yeah. Uh, and then they're like, and now let's show another video package. And they show that and they come back and he's still like not in the ring. And I don't know what the need to do this super long entrance is. It's not a bad song as much as it's just there's only 30 seconds of original original material in the song. Um, I don't know. <laughs> like, this isn't Triple H's theme where it's like a song. But like, yeah. I don't know. But I, I will say that I very much like uh, everything going on with um, Roman having essentially three feuds going on right now. He's got Balor yeah. on one end. But then he also has Lesnar directly in front of him. But then we brought out Big E uh, because the new WWE champion, Big E, is still a part of SmackDown. And uh, he's at least still there till the draft. And so, uh, but yeah, I I liked everything in this promo. um, And I did too. I just... This is a very WWE thing here. I'll, I'll explain this best I can, and I know you'll understand it because it's just it's so weird, but it's the truth. So like, I'm watching the show. I haven't watched it for a while. I'm not going to be mad at Finn and Big E against the Usos, right? Like, that's just objectively good professional wrestling. I enjoyed the match, and I was like, mm-hmm. this is good. And I looked at the time, and it was like the show was 33 minutes in, I think, when that match ended, and I was like, nothing's really been achieved. You know, like, they've <laughs> yeah, just sort that's of done I mean, stuff. Right? There's not a whole lot. Like, SmackDown doesn't necessarily value its own time very much. Just uh, fills time. It's yeah. just this machine. There's a lot of yeah. stuff yeah. where you look up and you're like, wow, you didn't do much in 40 minutes yeah. by the time we, we got here. <laughs> I mean, like the fact that eight minutes in and we were just like just starting the Roman promo. And uh, I, I just, I, I, I very much wonder what the wisdom is behind that. Genuinely wonder. Uh, and... Yeah, that, that's how I see that. But yeah, we did get the Usos versus Finn Balor and Big E. Not much of a win-win situation here because the Usos are the tag champs. Yeah. And Big E is the WWE champion and Finn Balor is the number one contender. So at some point, somebody who shouldn't be losing has to lose here. Uh, but otherwise, when you take a step back from that, it it was... You know, it, I like everybody in the match. There's I love the Usos. They were my tag team of the decade. Um, and I... Of course, I love Biggie. Biggie is uh, my spirit. He's Biggie. He's my spirit animal. <laughs> I I love Biggie. Are you kidding me? Him having the belt yeah. at the barber shop in that video is just. He's the greatest. He's the greatest. I, I remember vividly when you came on the distraction. They were doing the. Uh, they just done the draft. I want to say it's yeah. like a year ago now. Mm-hmm. And I remember saying on that show, and we had some fun talking about it, like. Well, I really think Big E is the most chance to be an actual star, like a real star, not yeah. a wrestling star, like a crossover, sitting on talk shows. <laughs> I'm ready for it, man. And, you know, I'm not like a WWE guy, but I just hope they give him the same shot that Drew got because, frankly, I think his upside is, like, yes. on a different level. And Blair's Drew. I don't say I'm not trying to know. He worked hard. But in terms of charisma and charm and personality, Big E's an all-time option. Like, this is a guy. He should have been there a while, but he's got there now. So I hope they give him a fair shot. Um, I I'll not too. comment on whether or not I believe that will happen. Uh, I would just say I hope it does. <laughs> I, I hope so too. Uh, I like I really am. I'm hoping he has a yeah. a solid WWE Championship run, and I hope it's not just a one and done as um, you know as Kofi's was. Like I, I want to see yeah. him in the title picture and around the title picture for a long time. Um, I mean, there the the other things talking about on the show. Uh, so like they had advertised Kevin Owens versus Happy Corbin, but Happy Corbin attacked Kevin Owens before the match, and then we just moved on. Uh, it didn't happen. Uh, so <laughs> there's there's a weird thing WWE's been doing now, and I don't understand it structurally, where – so 
<laughs> Seth Rollins' entrance music hits, and he starts making his way down to the ring. And they're like, we'll hear from Seth Rollins after the break. We come back from break. Um, and we get the Bianca Belair hometown girl video and listing all her accomplishments and all of that stuff uh, and how we're going to get her hometown celebration. Then we have Kayla Braxton interviewing Paul Heyman, um, and Paul Heyman is excellent here, and Paul Heyman's like, leave me alone, uh, Kayla Braxton. Uh, I am not the advocate for Brock Lesnar anymore. Uh, the, if you want a scoop, go find a scoop, but the... Uh, but leave me alone. You you can't be with me, blah, blah, blah. And he turns around, and Big E is waiting right there again. Paul Heyman congratulates Big E and says he made the smart decision going after the championship. He knew he could win because he couldn't beat Roman Reigns. Uh, but then Big E gets attacked by the Usos, and um, and Roman stands over uh, a fallen Big E, and, uh, and then that segment is over. And then we come back to the ring, and Seth Rollins is still in the ring, and then he starts his promo. And my question here is, am I to believe that Seth Rollins just like came out to the ring and just stood there while waiting for all of that to pass? And, I mean, he even acknowledged it. He even on the mic went, oh, that, that sucks for Big E. Somebody should have helped him. But why structurally, if you were structuring this show, did you have – do you – and they did this a bunch on Raw where, like, Drew McIntyre's music hit, and they're like, Drew McIntyre's got a match next. And then they played, like, three backstage yeah. segments. And then come back, and they're like, all right, now time for that Drew McIntyre match that he's been obviously standing here in the ring for for the last ten minutes. <laughs> as no, I mean, all I think there's, transpired. there's many reasons to analyze that, and I could give a sincere answer, but I have a question to your question. <laughs> yes. Why are we booking Seth Rollins to cut ten minute in ring promos anyway? <laughs> that's the real that's the real problem here. Just cut out the main issue. I'm sorry, look, I'm gonna be very I have wrestling is subjective. So if you like that segment or how, good luck. Mm-hmm. I cannot believe people like that in their pro wrestling. That ain't even a promo <laughs> to me, man. That's just a dude talking for like I don't even know what he was telling me. He's just talking and he's doing like stand up comedy stuff where he's like playing off the people and he's like charging around and the lights are all dimmed and it's like what is this? <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> and here's a bit like, I'm biased. I don't really particularly enjoy Seth Rollins. But part of it is because they make him do stuff like this. There are a handful of wrestlers ever well, that I am happy to listen to talk in the ring for 10 minutes. He isn't one of them, believe it or not, okay? But he isn't he's what they do it with Charlotte. I remember they used to send Braun out there for in-ring pro. Yes. Who needs this stuff? It's pointless. <laughs> it's terrible for the live crowd. No one enjoys it. It's just bad. To, I, I've never understood it. And I, last night, I lost my mind with that promo. He mm. kept going. It yeah. was terrible. No one even came off. Brutal. Yeah, yeah that sucked. Uh, yeah, I, there, there's just so much about this I don't get. But the, the, yeah. the entrance thing just drives me insane. Because it's not like throughout the segment um, before, I was sitting there waiting for like, all right, can't wait to see what Seth Rollins has to say once – Big E is done being jumped by the Usos. If anything, it was as soon as that segment was over, which I enjoyed, Seth Rollins in the ring. I'm like, oh, yeah, he just had an entrance like 10 minutes ago. (laughs) I forgot all about this. And, like, that is the one thing. Sorry to get all WWE versus AEW on you, folks, but I'm going to. Um, Because this was a point Eric Bischoff brought up, like, a year and a half ago. And... I didn't appreciate it until I went to my first Dynamite after he said it. But he was like, the thing I appreciate more uh, as I watch AEW is versus as I watch WWE is how much content AEW gives the fans in the arena. Um, and right. in that sense, uh, what he meant was... Uh, there isn't a whole lot happening backstage and there isn't a whole lot of having an audience sitting there watching stuff on a screen, except the one time that they actually did that at the Blood and Guts show. Uh, But for the most part, the show mostly transpires in the ring, not necessarily backstage. And just to think about the idea that you would send somebody out to the ring and have them stand there as a live audience is sitting there just staring at them. And it's like, okay, now go watch the screen while this wrestler is waiting for stuff to happen. I think is a tremendous waste of the fans time who paid to get in the building. Right. It, well, I think I read, 
because again, I was actually involved in the SmackDown discussion for this for the name of this show. So you know, I, I, the blue brand, I, I returned for this week, yes. and I read somewhere that there was like twenty, I want to say twenty four minutes of in ring time on SmackDown. No, no, don't tell me that. <laughs> so I think you know that tells you one thing. I, I'll be honest, you, I just hate. I hate the way a lot of it's formatted where it feels like they have no idea what's going to happen on the show until it's happening. Yes. I hate that, man. Like, I really despise it. And that's the thing is, I like in-ring promo segments. Mm-hmm. Do you know how much it helps me that Tony Schiavone sets most of those up as an interview? Because the idea is it's on the format. Schiavone's going to interview this guy. Yes. That's very different to guys just sort of walking out and talking in the middle of the restaurant and no one's stopping them. Um, but yeah, I believe it's like 20, <laughs> 23, 24 minutes of in-ring time. Like, I just think that's insane. And I know that if I tweeted it, I'll get quotes with that's wrestling's about characters and all this, you know, nonsense and all this. And it's true to some extent, like 22 minutes. Come on, man. You know, this, this like it pops up. AEW's women's division, they should try to make it good by its own standard, not compared to WWE. And like, there's obviously things WWE do better, but like when I watched SmackDown last night, Will, I was like, I can't believe these people log on and go crazy about AEW's women's division. Like, what is, what happened with the women last night? They did that two minute match, they had the finish that, you know, was what it was. Obviously, the closing segment. Um, am I wrong for, for thinking it's bad that matches don't go over two minutes? Mm. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it kind yeah. of seems bad to me, man. Yeah, I mean, it does. Especially when, like, again, I think about value. And, like, as I w- if I were paying to go to this show, I want as much content happening in front of me as possible. And as somebody who does go to shows often... Um, I tend to watch shows from that perspective of, was this a good value for people? And like, I don't know. I don't necessarily feel like that in particular was. Um, And yeah, like it it was the first time we'd seen like Tony Storm in a while or Liv Morgan like doing anything. And hey, we at least set up a pay-per-view match between Liv Morgan and Carmella. Uh, You know, and here's another thing. So Extreme Rules is coming up, right? You look at the Extreme Rules. I hate that Extreme Rules exist. Uh, And I say this because I'm looking at the Extreme Rules card. And I actually think it's a good card. Um, I think on paper, I'm like, this actually looks pretty decent. Um, Like a show that is, well, like all of these matches seem worthy of being on the pay-per-view. When you have... Becky versus Bianca and Damian Priest versus Sheamus, Charlotte versus Alexa Bliss, um, Roman Reigns versus Finn Balor, Usos versus the Street Profits, Liv Morgan versus Carmella. Like all of this is like stuff that's been built and seems like worthy of being on the pay-per-view. But the thing that everybody's talking about right now is that uh, this is extreme rules and none of these matches have any extreme stipulations on them. And they probably will, but they're all just going to be shoehorned next week because next week is the go-home show. I'm sure it's fun. (laughs) And so, like, none of this stuff uh, feels – like, all of this feels like any normal pay-per-view. And if this was just, like, WWE yeah. matches um, – I, I don't know if you could sell a pay-per-view called WWE matches. They should. I they should do should. that one. Yeah. yeah uh, but, like, if you just called this, like, WWE – what was the old September pay-per-view? Unforgiven. Fine. This is a good Unforgiven card. But it's extreme rules, and now everybody's stuck on the idea that there's um, – <laughs> extremely passing. <laughs> Thank you, Ed Talks. Uh, but the idea that people are now expecting and want these matches that all have extreme stipulations, but none of the feuds are calling for it. Like, I don't necessarily feel that Roman Reigns and Finn Balor are in such a blood feud that it's going to require some kind of extreme stipulation. Yeah. Uh, Bianca and Becky haven't had a regular match yet. Like, they had that quick one, but otherwise there hasn't been a match. Like, I always feel like that's kind of like the last resort um, to, like, yeah, okay, this feud has gone through everything it's gone through. Now it needs an extreme stipulation. Nothing on this card except maybe the Usos and Street Profits because it's gone on for so long has called for that. And they're going to shoehorn all of this in next week. I'm very concerned as a fan of of the so I want them to do Charlotte and Alexa as a wrestling match because I legitimately feel like I've seen Alexa wrestle once in the last year. Mm-hmm. And like I think that kind of is that's kinda of lame to me. Someone that enjoys her stuff. I'm very concerned they're gonna go like full themed cinematic, <laughs> you know. Because I know it's in Columbus, but like, that doesn't mean anything to them. They're idiots, right? Like 
I could absolutely see them doing a playground match where she's like walking around the swing set and stuff. And if that happens, Will, I'm going to immediately tweet you and be like, we shouldn't have complained about the stipulations. We should. I actually, on Twitch, ladies and gentlemen, I, I was on the Fightful Twitch, one of the leading wrestling websites in the world, and I had talked about this show for 15 minutes thinking it was Clash of Champions. <laughs> and the chat informed me multiple times it's Extreme Rules. And I was like, well, maybe it is. I don't know. It seems like Clash of Champions to me. So to me, Will, well, I'm looking forward to Clash of Champions next Sunday in Columbus. So I'm fired up for it, pal. I don't... Extreme rules, who needs it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, if this is a Clash of Champions, this is fine. Uh, because all of these are title matches except for Liv Morgan and Carmella. Like, it's fine as Clash of Champions. Yeah. Where it's not fine is Extreme Rules. But also, yeah. I don't want you to add, like, silly stipulations to this stuff. I'd rather you change the show than change the matches. That's what yeah. I would Which is personally. telling, right? But then this yeah. is the, you know, and this is the real core of these conversations is the, the bar is on the floor. <laughs> You know, like like people are going to accept, like they're going to announce like a chair match and people are like, yeah, I'm excited. And then we have to pretend, you know, it's terrible. I don't know. I don't know. It's not new. Now, by the way, while we're doing this, this, this segment has become me asking you questions about WWE like, I, like I'm like an alien. But I'm intrigued. Have I, like, did I miss an episode of, or a memo in terms of Rick Boogs? Because I tuned in to WWE Friday Night Smackdown last night. He beat Bob Roode about two minutes flat and I nearly broke my television set. <laughs> I nearly, I nearly just lost my mind. I, and I get it. Bob Roode's old, and you know, who is he? What does he do? He's guitar guy that uh, Pat McAfee marks for. And <laughs> why is Shinsuke his second now? Yeah, I don't know. And then yeah, Shinsuke is facing. Um, oh, that's another one that got added. But we're going to see Shinsuke take on um, Apollo Cruz. Which, you know, I was having a conversation with uh, Phil Lindsay last week, and he brought up what happened to Apollo Crews. Like, that was, uh, they got, and I, that's, the funny thing is, I said that, it, it had a lot of backlash because they were like, no, 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 he's embracing his heritage. And they said, the thing about the kind of gimmick is that it has a shelf life, and that, like, you're only really going to get those initial promos out of it, but ultimately, mm-hmm. that kind of gimmick doesn't have any longevity and yes. it doesn't feel like anything's happened with Apollo in the last couple of months. And now he's having this match with Shinsuke coming up. He'll probably lose and we move on. Yeah. And he'll get moved to the other brand where he can fill the same role of mid card loser because they, in their minds, we've given him his big win. He has credibility, right? And yes. you know, this be honest, the, when you say something like that, the response is always like you're asked to let it play out. But then once it's played out, you're not allowed to be, like, correct about it, you know? <laughs> like, it's now played out. Will was right, but no one's coming back to you saying you were correct. Like, it's just I, – I think Apollo is – to me, he's such an indictment of their system, man. I really do. Like, I, I get that everyone needs characters and personas and all this, you know, nonsense. But, like, he can do a lot. He could. And when and they – yeah. I just wanted when, to see him be a kick-ass wrestler. Uh, yes. And um, – <laughs> They had it for a while. Do you remember when he got the US title on Raw and he was yeah. just kind of being himself? And it was like, oh, I can do this. is a good mid card baby, upper mid card baby face. And it's like, no, he has to be like a full on gimmick. Character. He's a gimmick. Yeah, like, he has to be a character. If he wants to do it, then fair. But like, let's be honest, that's what it is. And, and as you said perfectly, a gimmick like that, it isn't the sort of thing that's going to sustain at the top level. You yeah. know, it will come up and it will go down. So it's a shame. I don't know what his prospects are in that promotion, but I'll be real with you. If you'd have told me two years ago he'd have got this far, where he was at at that point, I'd have been like, good for Apollo, man. Because yeah. at the point there, he was never on TV, right? No, so he wasn't. But it was clear that, like, they liked him. Because, yeah, like, yeah. especially if you're, like, a body guy or a body company, like, Apollo Crews has a great fucking body. Like, that's, that's yeah. the thing. Is I, I could have absolutely seen that. Um, the other, I guess the only other thing to talk about uh, is the main event segment. It was the homecoming celebration of one Bianca Belair. Uh, which featured Mayor Kane, uh, who looks like hell, but whatever. Um, you would not think that's a person like working regularly, um, anything but like conventions, but he is the mayor of Dog County, Tennessee. Uh, and uh, he introduces Bianca, uh, big reaction. They, they focused on her family and like all of that, and like all of that was great. Um, and she's interrupted by Becky Lynch. Uh, I said on RBR this week, and this isn't just a WWE take, I mentioned it about the Elite as well, that I think uh, looking stupid is cheap heat and that there's um, other ways to get it. But apparently 
we we've got Becky, we got Seth Rollins, we got the the elite. Like it is just the go to of how can I look ridiculous to get the crowd to boo, and but it yeah. works. Yeah, you know, I I actually have paid attention to this stuff because I was intrigued how the crowd reacted, and in fairness. I guess it's worked. I think our friend Tape Machines, famed Twitter personality, put it best when he said, like, Becky's way of doing this is basically she's just terrible. Because, <laughs> like, that's not, like, they'll boo her because it's bad. And, like, I don't know, maybe that's unpopular, but I think this stuff's, I mean, she's kind of awful in it, but that's the idea, I guess. I don't know. Will, I don't know. <laughs> they yeah, boo uh, her now. Like, like, I, but... I, I, I am not really, like, enjoying Becky in this role, but I guess I'm not yeah. supposed to. Uh, because I guess she's she's trying to make us hate her, uh, and with this crowd, it did work. Uh, the crowd yeah. was, and of course, it was Bianca's hometown crowd, so um, that was the reaction she was going to get. But yeah, uh, Becky um, interrupts, and uh, I thought something was going to happen with that key to the city, like using it as a weapon, because Bianca was given the key to the city by Kane. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I guess it's just a real key to the city. And that was that. Like, that is somebody going to like use that as a weapon, yeah. like choke somebody with it? Is that what's happening here? And then, no, it was just a key to the city. Um, and so, uh, I'm sorry, I had to bring up the Bob Rude deserves better. Um, Bob Rude for the fleet, brother. Give me some AEW dog matches in the impact zone with Bob Rude. All hell. There you go. Now, now we're cooking. Well. Uh, That's when the territory really picks up. Yeah, and then Reese says the McGregor act was overplayed, uh, but the stuff here stinks. Um, yeah, and so, I, I, of course, um, Bianca gets shown up again because uh, she they shake hands. She holds on to Becky this time, and it was supposed to kind of play up what happened at SummerSlam, except Becky shows her up again and hits her with a urinagi and walks away, and that's, the oh. end, that's how the show ended. It rules so much. Like, <laughs> it rules so much they did that. And I know that your reaction is the same as mine, which is like, yep, that's what they would do, of course. And then you move on. Like, it's so... The bar is on the floor, my friend. I mean, yes. I've watched that, and I was just like, that is exactly what I'd expect them to do, yes. Like, why you would do that, I don't know. But everyone has to be grounded in some form or fashion. I'd be, I'll say this much. They have my interest in terms of the result of that match. Mm-hmm. Not because they've done a great job telling a story, purely because my booking mind is like, Good luck, guys. You know, I, I don't know. Because I think there's a chance that she... I think there's a chance that Becky drops the belt and just goes to the other brand. Yeah. And it's like... There's another like, piece of me that says that if they don't put a step on this, I see it in a DQ and they just extend it. Like, right. that's how that's yeah. where my trust is with, with all of that. Yeah, and that's the problem, right? Because when you build that in your audience, it's hard to get excited about stuff. Quickly, before we, we depart this, um, this, this apparently great SmackDown program, um, what are they doing with Brock and Roman? Like, in terms of that, what I just said about finishes, like, because I, I don't care. I'm not going to pretend to be, like, angry about it, but, like, the idea of Brock coming back and beating the guy that no one can beat seems like a great example of, like, everything wrong with the promotions booking for the last decade. Is Brock winning that belt? What, what do we think? I have there? no idea, to be honest. Because yeah. um, I would like to see them surprise us and have, like, Finn win. And then, because yes. they say it's only a title match if Roman retains, and then wouldn't it be a shocker if, Roman didn't, and right. the match still happens, but it's non-title. Um, I don't know. I, I honestly don't. I do, yeah. though, uh, have to part. So, folks, um, because um, my daughter has a thing in five minutes, and I just got a text from my wife that's like, hey, uh, you realize that uh, <laughs> yeah, there, there's a thing happening. And so, yeah, I have to get her to that. Joe, thank you for being here, talking uh all the things here uh and i'm going across the pond again next week because uh joining us here on wrestling with weekends is my old dear friend of the last like god i've known him 12 years now but barry murphy is joining me here on uh wrestling with weekends so uh please come check that out uh outside of that folks uh, again, like I said, I can't do it on the video version anymore. So the closing music will have to, to stay on the audio version. Uh, but I will say that that is it for this edition of Wrestling with Weekends. Thanks for joining me again for Joe Holt. I'm William R. Washington. We will see you next time and have a great afternoon. 
Let's see. I walks up in the club. And the ladies looking lovely. Tried to show some love. But the gator tried to mug me. Walk up to the bar. And I tried to get my drag on. Death on my feet. If you want to get bang on. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, Thanks for having me, Have a good day, yeah. Sorry we went a little long, my man. This has been a production of fanoff.com. And that's perfect.